This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. After a week off, welcome back to uh, Friday morning conference. Uh, our speaker this morning is Dr. Godley Jack. Godley is one of our first year clinical fellows. If you have not yet had the chance to meet him, Godley uh, did his undergraduate studies in medical school at the University of Maryland, did residency at the University of North Carolina. And as you can read on the screen, he's going to talk to us today about cardiac tumors. Godly. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, as Dr. Williams said, my name is Godly Jack, um, and I'm one of the first year fellows here. And today I'm going to be delivering an exciting talk on the world of cardiac tumors. Um, and I chose this topic for two particular reasons. The first being that I thought it was an area of particular weakness in my own medical knowledge. And I thought it'd be fun and exciting to learn more about it. And second is that really the evaluation and the establishment of a differential diagnosis um, when uh, finding a cardiac mass on echo or other cardiac imaging is something that comes up very, very often. So I thought it was gonna be an important tool or an important uh, weapon in our, our repertoire to have because this comes up very often. And so my goal for today is to get you guys excited about cardiac tumors and to have everyone walking away with more information that you can use to establish a good uh, differential diagnosis when you see a cardiac mass. Um, so the structure of this talk is that I'm going to <clears throat> um, give information about different cardiac tumors um, somewhat individually and I'm going to intersperse that with different um, cases that we've seen within the Grady within the Emory Hospital system, um, and within that uh, are going to be different cases. And then towards the end, we're going to put it all together in a way that helps us uh, learn how to establish a differential. So my objectives for today are to establish a general knowledge about these tumors and neoplasms understand the gross and microscopic pathology for some of them, but not all. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the classic echo findings and some of these tumors as well. And then again, at the end, we're going to put it all together in a way that makes sense. Um, so why is this important? Why should you even pay attention today? So um, again, establishing a differential that includes neoplasm is going to be important. And at the end of the day, um, being confident in your differential for a cardiac mass is going to help affect your management strategies and your treatment strategies for your patients in the hospital. Um, you know, so if I know, you know, if I know more about angiosarcomas and I'm more, I can be more confident to say this is an angiosarcoma, this is a myxoma, and I'm more likely or more confident to tell the primary team not to anticoagulate. So that's why this is important. Um, so we're going to start with the pop quiz. And I have a $20 Amazon gift card for a fellow that can name the correct, the next cardiac mass correctly. And we have a pre-volunteer and it is only gonna be one slide because I didn't have time for three. Um, Dr. Ann Young has volunteered and I need to know if Ann Young is out there. Oh, doesn't look like Ann is here. So uh, is anyone, any other fellow available to claim this $20 reward? Godly, I can volunteer someone if you'd like me to. Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, I see Evan Blank out there, Evan. Evan Blank's been volunteering. I am here. Okay, this should be an easy one for Evan. All right, Evan, can you see the screen? Last words, I can. All right, so for a $20 Amazon gift card, could you correctly name the following cardiac mass? This is pretty, should be pretty straightforward for you. This is a 54-year-old male that presents us with chest pain. Uh, my small phone, this looks <laughs> like a, is that a fibroblastoma? Yes, that is correct. Excellent job to Evan. I will see you shortly. All right, so moving on. Thank you, Evan. So Thank cardiac, you, Evan. yep, no problem. So cardiac um, tumors are neoplasms arising either, arising either from the heart itself or from other organs in the body that metastasize to the heart. And uh, a major takeaway that I want everyone to walk away with, away with from this talk is that metastases to the heart are much, much, much more common than primary malignancies of the heart. And 
car benign cardiac tumors are often discovered incidentally, either on autopsy or again, incidentally on some other imaging finding like an echo or a CAT scan, um, or for, for example, a CT abdomen that gets a view of the heart and sees one of these tumors in someone who's otherwise asymptomatic. The clinical presentation of a cardiac mass is gonna be extremely variable. Um, but it's going to boil down to three subtypes. The first is going to be mechanical obstruction. Um, the second is going to be embolization, either to the brain, the leg, you know, the pulmonary circulation. And the third is something that I learned um, newly from reading about this, is that a lot of these tumors, such as myxomas, can release pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause systemic sy symptoms. Um, rarely, this can also present as sudden death, and these uh, masses can be found on autopsy afterwards. The incidence of benign cardiac tumors is extremely rare, and the range is anywhere from 0.001 to 0.3%. Um, and I forgot to mention, you can also have uh, errors in conduction as well. Sorry, there we go. Uh, issues in conduction as well. Um, so generally, these are going to be diagnosed non-invasively by echo, MRI, and CT scan, but the gold standard for diagnosing a cardiac tumor is always going to be biopsy and histopathologic um, assessment, and treatment generally is entirely surgical. So another major takeaway is that um, metastatic tumors to the heart, generally speaking, are a sign of uh, end-stage disease with a very poor prognosis, whereas on the flip side, benign cardiac tumors carry a much better prognosis and um, much better prognosis after surgery, and surgery usually sees low rates of complications and recurrence. Um, I included this slide because we're going to start talking about the different subtypes, and the this is kind of the algorithm to keep in your head of cardiac tumors. They're either going to be primary coming from the heart or secondary coming from other parts of the body. And again, of primaries, they're either going to be benign or malignant. Um, so metastatic cardiac tumors. So again, I mentioned by far and away, these are going to be the most common tumors you see in your clinical practice. And if you know that someone ha you, one of your patients has a history of a cancer or metastatic cancer, you can say with a fair amount of confidence that if you see a cardiac mass in one of those patients, it's probably going to be from that same um, tumor of origin. Um, so these are the most common neoplasms. And I saw in my literature review a, a, very, wide, a very wide range of rates in comparison to benign. But this is going to be anywhere from 40 to 100 to 1,000 times more common than a, a primary cardiac tumor. This is going to play really well into some of the slides and some of the cases that we talk about later. Um, but if there's ever debate, I want you guys to keep that number in mind. It's at least 40 times more common than a, but not, than a primary tumor of the heart. Um, in an autopsy series of 1,900 patients that were dying of cancer, 8% of these actually had 8% of those patients with cancer had um, cardiac metastases. We're going to talk a little bit later about the method of spread of these types of cancers and how knowing how different types of metastatic cancer spread specifically can help you come up with your differential. So this is a 54-year-old female that presented to Grady Hospital in 1999. I'm sorry, she was diagnosed in 1999 with the diagnosis of metastatic melanoma. And she presented to Grady in 2001. I'm sorry, she also had a history of um, previous resections. So she had had um, a left axillary resection um, and a resection in her back as well of metastatic disease. And she presented to Grady in 2001 for routine imaging surveillance, um, given these are, are so aggressive. And what they found was a, a, left ventri a large left ventricular mass on CAT scan. And on further imaging, the echo shows that she has a large uh, left ventricular mass that's not only encompassing a large portion of her LV cavity, but it's actually invading um, 
um, a significant portion of her mitral apparatus. So this tumor was actually invading her posterior papillary, her entire posterior papillary muscle, as well as her P2, uh, P3 leaflets and a um, and the posterior cordae associated with it. So she underwent a, a pretty large um, cardiac surgery. So she was taken to the OR and what they found in the OR was uh, similar to what was found on echoes that this, this tissue was invading the post, mostly the posterior mitral apparatus. They were able to excise the tumor with pretty, with good tumor, with, with good margins. And they had to extract the papillary muscle um, the the posterior cordae and reconstruct her mitral apparatus with the with a bioprosthetic valve and portions of the leaflet that were left over. So she did well postoperatively, um, and she survived for another four or five years before she was um, ultimately referred to hospice. So I mentioned previously that um, knowing the how different tumors spread to the heart is gonna be critical in forming your differential. And I would add more broadly that diagnosing a cardiac mass does not come down to one imaging finding or one lab study or um, really any one piece of information can diagnose it besides the biopsy, but it's really the amalgamation of different modalities and different clues that you're gonna get in your history, your physical, and your information from what we're talking about today is gonna to help lead you to your diagnosis. And one of those puzzle pieces is again, knowing where different metastatic or different cancers, how they spread to the heart. So um, leukemias, lymphomas, which is somewhat obvious, but leukemias, lymphomas, and mesotheliomas tend to spread to the heart through the lymphatic system. Breast cancer, melanoma, lung cancer, GI and GU cancers, and again, mesotheliomas also spread through hematogenous spread. Lung cancer, breast cancer, esophageal and mediastinal invasive tumors tend to invade directly through the tissue and extend to the heart muscle itself. Um, and last important category, renal cell, um, liver cancers, lung, thyroid, leomyosarcomas and adrenal sarcomas um, uh, invade directly through the venous system through the veins themselves. So this information may help you if, you know, if you see a renal mass and you know someone has a renal cell carcinoma and they present with a right atrial mass, you already probably know it's a renal cell carcinoma. But if you can see on CT scan that the tumor is invading, invading the IVC or, or invading the renal vein, you pretty much got a slam dunk to say that that's a renal cell carcinoma. And that's what you bring back to your, your primary team as the consultant. So again, this is a, a big part of the puzzle piece. Um, and this, this table is really more of a reference. Um, so this is an example of a renal cell carcinoma um, uh, that was discovered on TEE. And again, it's, it's encompassing a, a big portion of the, um, the right atrium. Now, I wasn't able to dig up the clinical history in this case, but I added this slide to show you that um, the mass itself, you can't really differentiate it from our from prior masses based on the morphology of, the, of it on echo itself. You kind of have to take the whole clinical picture and know, for example, that this patient had a, a history of renal cell carcinoma, either previously treated or, or active. Um, yeah, so that's why I included this slide. Um, metastatic cardiac tumor. So this is a study out of the Journal of Clinical Pathology in 2007. And, um, over a span of uh, about 10 to 12 years, they took a, um, a group of patients out of a hospital in Italy, I believe. Um, and at this hospital, they routinely um, autopsy all of their patients that pass away. Uh, all of their patients that pass away. And they found that um, uh, a, large percentage of these, a large percentage of these patients had um, metastatic disease to the heart. I think it was about six to 8%. Um, and what they were able to do was um, autop not only autopsy, but take um, histopathology of the cardiac masses and provide us with information about what they saw. And surprisingly to me, the most common mass that they saw that was metastatic to the heart was mesothelioma. 
uh, mesothelioma, followed by metastatic melanoma, which I think is more traditionally thought to be closely associated with cardiac metastases, adenocarcinoma of the lung, undifferentiated cancers, um, squamous cell of the lung, breast, ovarian, and then renal. So those were the, the eight most common um, metastatic tumors that they found on pathology. So this is another interesting case from, I've, there are a lot of interesting cases that come through Grady. This was this was one of them. So this was a, a 46, this is a 46 year old gentleman that presented to Grady with a history of an anterior metastinal mass. And um, though they hadn't come with a diagnosis yet, he had presented with to Grady with chest pain and shortness of breath in 2005. Um, so as a part of his workup, he got a biopsy done at Grady that was non-diagnostic. And he had a CT scan that showed a large pericardial effusion, partly of which we can see here. Um, and the effusion on echo showed evidence of tamponade. So at Grady, he also got a uh, pericardial window that was done successfully. Now, um, unfortunately, they didn't come to a final diagnosis at Grady and they were back and forth between uh, this being a, a B cell lymphoma or other types of um, metastatic disease. And he ultimately got transferred, uh, ultimately got transferred to Emory Maine Hospital. Now, Emory, Maine, um, he um, was doing okay initially. I think he got another biopsy that was inconclusive. But unfortunately, on day three or day four, he started to decompensate. He became more tachycardic and more short of breath um, and unfortunately passed away just a few days later in the ICU. Now, what they found in this case on autopsy was that he not only had a saddle PE, which is probably what he died from, um, but the uh, anterior metastinal mass was discovered to be a malignant thymoma. And that mass actually um, was invading um, the lung tissue, the heart, and many structures of the anterior metastinum. So again, direct um, tissue invasion. And uh, what they found grossly was that his, the, his entire anterior and lateral heart were encased with tumor. Um, so that's this slide. And this kind of ties back to how I think I had thymomas as invading directly through the heart. And they, they, this was a puzzling case because B cell lymphomas, as I'm going to talk about later, generally present within the, the pericardium and it can be associated with pericardial effusions as well. So I thought that was an interesting case. Um, so that concludes our talk on metastatic tumors. And next, we're going to move into primary cardiac tumors. Again, it's important to walk away with this talk knowing that primary cardiac tumors are much, much more rare. And of primary cardiac tumors, benign tumors are significantly more likely. 90 to 94% of primary tumors of the heart are benign and are generally amenable to surgical resection, whereas only 6% are malignant. So the, um, having a malignant cardiac tumor is extraordinarily rare, and you have to have a very high clinical index of suspicion to suspect it. So moving on to benign cardiac tumors, I think this pie chart is a little bit underrepresented for myxoma. This is a chart, this is a, a pie chart out of the out of the Atlas of Tumor Pathology published in 1978 by McAllister. And the most common cardiac tumors when they looked at a, um, a number of cardiac tumors over a certain period of time was the um, cardiac myxoma. And then followed behind it was lipoma, papillae, fibroma, rhabdomyoma. And then the other subtypes are sub under 10%. So fibroma, hemangioma, and the others. But again, myxoma is going to be your most common. Um, so the cardiac myxoma is, uh, there's still some debate about the cell line of origin that, that it comes from, but it's believed to be originated from a multipotent mesenchymal stem cell. And these stem cells can develop into cardiogenic, uh, neurogenic, or endothelial cells. Um, and they most commonly, not always, but most commonly are gonna present in the left ventricle. Um, they can present in, I'm sorry, the left atrium, sorry, mostly in the left atrium, 20% in the right atrium and 5% in the ventricles. Now it's important to know that all of these are gonna arise from the endocardial surface. So myxomas do not generally invade the heart tissue. 
they invade the the uh the space within the chamber um um again they arise exclusively from the cardiac and the cardium they have a slight female predominance and they mostly occur at, at people in their middle age so the cells within the myxoma are going to be uh um multiple different types of cells this was an 85 year old that presented to emory um emory midtown hospital she was an 85 year old female with a history of ckd hypertension hyperlipidemia diabetes um hefpef and um copd and she presented to us with shortness of breath that she felt was different than her copd shortness of breath and what was found on imaging was this large left atrial mass and keep in mind uh something that's pretty um common for atrial myxomas is that it's attached to uh, the septum, the atrial septum. Um, so she underwent a successful um, left atrial myxoma um, um, removal and did relatively well afterwards. But she had a common complication of uh, myxoma removal, which is uh, the development of atrial fibrillation post-op. So she was started on Coumadin and did relatively well thereafter. Um, this is that same patient um, seen on cardiac MRI. And again, uh, I, I harp on the fact that most commonly, but not always, these atrial myxomas are going to be attached to the septum. And many are related to the uh, attached near the fossa ovalis. So grossly, this is a picture of myxoma. Grossly, um, you're going to see something that looks like this. About two thirds of them are more rounded or oval shaped or and they have sessile polyps and they're going to have a short broad base stem attaching them to the endocardium again most commonly at the atrial septum but about a third of these are going to be a little bit more gelatinous and irregular with papillary structures jutting out of them there's common um, calcification involved near the core and these can embolize and can also be associated with pro-inflammatory, release of pro-inflammatory cytokines causing systemic symptoms. Um, this is another um, case that was at uh, Emory um, Main Hospital or at Clifton Hospital. And I include this one, this one's a little bit bigger. Again, you see that it's classically, it looks to be attached to the atrial septum, but this one actually juts through the mitral valve and um, I include this because many of these tumors, but not all, on physical exam are gonna, you're gonna find what's called the, the tumor plop, which is an early diastolic heart sound heard when the tumor plops through the mitral valve. And that's one of the classic um, teachings about atrial myxomas if they grow to be the right size. Histopathologically, um, these are gonna um, um, be diagnosed by the presence of the myxoma cell, which is a polygonal or stellate syncytial cell. And again, I mentioned earlier, towards the center of the, of the tumor, you can see calcification or even metaplastic bone involved. Um, these tumors generally do not invade the myocardium. So if you see one that does, it's less likely, much less likely that this is a myxoma, almost impossible. This is another patient, kind of classic again. Um, in this case, this was a very young female. She was 21 years old. She presented to Grady with chest pain and shortness of breath. Um, she... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So, sorry, this was not the 21 year old. This is another patient. The reason I included this one was that um, this patient also developed post op AFib from atrial myxoma resection. And that leads me into this next paper that was published um, out of a hospital in the Netherlands where they retrospectively looked at uh, a case, cases of 82 patients. Um, and they looked at um, patients that had left our atrial myxomas that were excised successfully. The most common presenting symptom was dyspnea, palpitations, chest pain, um, emboliz or embolization. And many of these patients had concurrent heart sur uh, concurrent valvular surgery or coronary surgery as well. Now, I also included this study to mention that um, the post-op clinical course was very good. So there was a remarkable increase in NYHA classification post-op, but AFib was the most common post-operative complication and it occurred as, in as many as 22% of patients at seven-year follow-up. Um, in, this, in this case, there was a 0% um, recurrence at seven years of myxoma. 
Um, this second this uh, second study was done a little bit over a, a longer period of time. Uh, so this was 1955 to 2011 at Mayo Clinic, and they again looked at patients who had left a, or atrial myxomas um, excised surgery surgically. Um, and they actually included both atrial and ventricular. And of 194 patients, the operative mortality was only 0.5%. And when they looked overall at the Kaplan-Meier curve that I display here, the survival was no different post-op from atrial from mixed cardiac myxoma resection compared to the general population. Um, there was a tumor recurrence in 11 of the 194 patients. And I attribute that possibly due to this being an older study that started in 1955, and it's possible that their surgical technique was not as, as good as it, is, as it is now or more recently. But because they did have um, a certain rate of tumor recurrence, they were able to do um, statistical analysis of those factors that were associated with tumor recurrence, recurrence. And what they found was that younger age surgery, smaller tumor dimension and tumor localized to the ventricles were predictors of recurrence. I think younger age is uh, pretty obvious because you have more time after surgery to develop recurrence. Um, and then smaller tumor dimension and tumor in the ventricle, I can imagine maybe just related to uh, the difficulty of surgery with doing a complete resection or visualizing the residual tumor uh, intraoperatively. But again, they saw no difference in survival um, Neither this or the first study saw a difference in survival post-op. So this was generally showed that these, these patients have good outcomes. I wanted to include one, si one um, slide about um, a, a very rare uh, syndrome related to atrial myxoma. It's called the Carney complex or Carney syndrome. And this is an autosomal dominant um, disorder seen in 5 to 10% 5 to 10 of patients that present with cardiac myxomas. And in addition to the cardiac myxoma, these patients can develop um, cutaneous myxomas um, and tumors of the pituitary, the testes, or, or even the breast. Um, and what's most, what's most recognized with these tumors, with this syndrome, is that 70 to 80% of them present with these skin lesions um, that are the indigenous skin pigmentations that I kind of, where there's a nice animation of that here. But most classically, you see schwannomas, calcified Sertoli cell tumors of the testes and uh, breast ductal adenomas as well. Um, so these are the major takeaways. So they're rare but common. Uh, surgical resection is good. The papillae fibroma is a little bit um, is a little bit different from the other tumors. These are avascular structures that are lined by endothelial cells and they have a proteoglycan rich stromal core um, connected to a papillary stalk at the endothelium. Um, and, and these are most commonly going to um, connect to valves. And what they most classically look like is sea enemas, especially when these um, resected tumors are dipped in water. Um, uh, about a third of these are going to be, this is, uh, sorry, the third most common primary cardiac tumor. Um, and some people would argue that this is uh, just an exaggerated form of a Lambos excretions, which also manifests um, similarly at similar locations. Um, this is a small study out of the Mayo Clinic from 95 to 2010, and out of 184 patients, they were able to describe the, the mean size. It was a pretty variable size. I include this slide to show that these fibroelastomas don't get very, very big. So having an elastoma greater than two, uh, 20 millimeters is, is somewhat rare. They're most commonly going to be smaller than 20 millimeters. Um, this was the di distribution by location. These um, masses most commonly present on the valve with the aortic valve being the most common. Um, so this was uh, a gentleman that presented um, to Grady with chest pain and shortness of breath. And he was found to have a papillary fibroelastoma on the, um, the left coronary cusp of his aortic valve. And this was excised. So the entire aortic valve was excised and he had a bioprosthetic valve put in its place. Um, one of the complications he had actually of the mass itself was that he had really bad AI that I wasn't able to, to get a picture of, but he did, rel he did relatively well afterwards. Lipomas are the second most common, and these are uh, histo histopathologically, they're very similar to lipomas in other parts of the body. It's just a benign proliferation of 
um, adipose tissue. Half of these tumors are going to present an endocardial surface, and the other half are going to be, uh, I'm sorry, the subendocardial region, and the other half are going to be either within the myocardium or the subepicardial regions. And most commonly, these are going to present with mass effect or arrhythmias from conduction block. Um, so this is our 21-year-old female that presented to Grady with an enormous uh, mass in the right atrium that ended up being a lipoma. Her mass was so large that it actually encased, um, uh, actually involved parts of the posterior left atrium. She had to have uh, large pieces of the atrium removed and replaced with bovine pericardium. And she did relatively well afterwards as well. The rhabdomyoma is a, hammer, is a hamartoma of cardiac myocytes that's most commonly seen in children as a part of tuberous sclerosis, which is a abnormal proliferation of uh, neural crest cells. And if you remember, these children can also have um, angiolipomas of the kidney, astrocytomas in the brain, and angiofibromas of the skin, which are pictured on the right. You're generally not going to see these in adults, um, the most commonly in children, but what you're going to see grossly is that these tumors tend to present with multiple, multiple tumors in the heart. Um, and generally, many, if these kids don't, if these children uh, don't pass away in utero, they generally, um, a lot of times these tumors will resolve on their own if they survive the first month of life. This is a, a gross specimen. So on the left, we talked about this gross specimen. On the right, this is one of the tumors which has been excised. And you see that nodular white fleshy appearance that is most classic of a rhabdomyoma. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention rhabdomyomas are a proliferation of, of, of the heart muscle itself. And these are just examples of uh, slides on histopathology. They're usually eosinophilic in color. Fibromas are neoplastic for proliferation of fibroblasts. And if you remember, fibroblasts are part of the core structure of many um, connective tissues. Um, these are gonna be well circumscribed, but can invade into the myocardium and often do. And they're usually gonna be involved uh, at the ventricular septum. And the calcification is very common. This again is an, another picture of some histopathologic slides. Um, Grossly, it looks like it does not invade, but these tumors do invade the myocardium. Um, they often have, so when you're born, these have um, a strong predominance of fibro, fibrobla fibroblast encased in collagen. But as you get older, the proportion of collagen uh, increases to the point where these tumors can mimic um, scar in older patients. Um, so moving on to malignant cardiac tumors. Um, so this is the dis distribution from that same source. And again, the major takeaway is that the malignant primary cardiac tumors are extraordinarily rare, but most common is going to be angiosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and mesothelioma. Um, so this is an example of angiosarcoma seen on CT scan involving the right atrium. And this is, again, a very rare cancer that is an abnormal proliferation of blood vessels. And this represents about 30 to 40 percent of sarcomas. Um, the pathology can overlap Kaposi sarcoma, and they, they present predominantly in the right atrium. Now, remember, you can get angiosarcoma. There are some areas of the body that are um, more prone to developing angiosarcomas. And being um, and developing metastatic sarcoma to the heart, but the heart itself can also de develop an angiosarcoma that's primarily coming from the heart. Here I have some gross specimens and some histopathologic specimens, um, and this is just an example that I kind of included. Um, in this case, we have one invading the posterior leaflet. Rhabdomyosarcomas are the same as rhabdomyomas, except that these can become, we call it a rhabdomyosarcoma when it becomes malignant. Um, this is going to be about 5 to 20% of cardiac sarcomas, and the histopathology is going to be similar to rhabdomyomas that we discussed previously. Fibrosarcomas, again, these are just fibromas that become malignant, and we see a white fleshy tumor encompassed in fibrocytes. Um, these can extensively invade the myocardium and they are extraordinarily rare, only about 3% of malignant tumors. And again, survival is extremely poor. The leomyosarcoma is composed of smooth muscle tissue that most commonly invades 
um, the left atrium. It comes, originates from the, um, the pulmonary veins. And this is a case of a patient that presented with chest pain, shortness of breath, um, and dyspnea on exertion. And what she was found to have is a leomyoma, leomyosarcoma that was very classic. So it looks like it originated from the left, um, sorry, uh, originated from the pulmonary veins and extended directly into the left atrium. These come with a very, very poor prognosis with a mean survival of six months, and they grow extremely rapidly. And this is just a gross um, image of, of that same case. So in summary, sarcomas proliferate rapidly. They are extraordinarily rare. They're, um, they have poor outcomes, but survival is improved with tumor resection plus chemotherapy. And I have a Kaplan-Meier curve here. The red is with treatment and the blue is without. The cardiac lymphoma is a metastatic tumor of the heart that's somewhat different. It's, it's separate from the sarcomas. And these are B cell proliferations um, that are, can be any of the lymphomas that we know from, you know, traditionally speaking. We can have follicular cell lymphomas, the fuselage B cell, Burkitt's, all of these can present within the heart. They most classically present within the pericardium, but can also directly invade the myocardium. When invading the myocardium, we usually see multiple firm white fleshy nodules. And in the pericardium, they're gonna be, it's gonna, you're gonna have a thickened pericardium, white gray tumor infiltration and epicardial arteries that are constricted by tumor. Very, very, very poor outcomes. Other tumors that you may hear about, Purkinje cell hematomas, cystic tumor of the AV node, cardiac hemangioma, paragangliomas, um, extramedullary plasmocytoma and fibros, fibrous histiocytoma. Now, before we go into our conclusions, um, this is a, another key puzzle piece in putting it all together. The addition of contrast echocardiography helps us differentiate um, thrombus from um, tumors and tumors that are very active or tumors that have a lot of blood cells are gonna brighten up more than those that don't. So at the top, I have a, th a thrombus and you can see that it's completely dark. It does not um, uh, take up any contrast. Um, and you're more confident in saying that this is a thrombus if it's attached to a thin, dead piece of heart. The sarcoma is an extremely um, active tumor with, uh, with significant proliferation of blood cells. So it's gonna light up a lot more. The myxoma is somewhere in between. So although this was not lighting up very robustly, it does have some infiltration. So let's put it all together. So now that we have the basic information about um, classic image findings, presentation, histopathology, um, gross specimens, and how these tumors metastasize, what's more common, let's put it all together. So this is a, a really good paper that I found out of the Journal of Echo Research and Practice in 2016. And they looked at differentiating cardiac masses based on all of these findings. And what it boils down to is the clinical context, characteristics, localization, and age. And what I was speaking more broadly, the diagnosis of a cardiac mass, again, is not gonna come from any one finding besides pathology. It's not gonna come from any one finding. It's really the amalgam, the amalgamation of history, a good physical exam, you know, sometimes multiple imaging findings, including CT, MRI, echocardiography, um, and having in your repertoire, um, having uh, being having being having um, knowing all the details that we've talked about in this talk is going to help you as well. Um, so this, I think, is a critical, critical slide. They were able to, um, so this was republished um, from another paper, but they looked at, um, so what we've talked about so far is uh, tumors and where they're most likely to arise. This worked backwards, and they, they said if the tumor, we're looking at if the tumor is coming from a particular place, what's it most likely to be? And I think this is kind of more relevant because this is how we're going to see it in clinical practice. So for example, if you have a tumor arising from the valve, 
it's probably a thrombus, a vegetation, or a fibroelastoma in that order. Um, fibroelastomas don't usually arise from other places. Vegetations can, but don't usually arise from other places. If I see a tumor in the right atrium, my differential is a little bit more broad, but that's most commonly a thrombus, a met, a myxoma, an angiosarcoma, a lipoma, or a lymphoma. So I thought this was a crucial part of the puzzle. Uh, putting it all together, this is our algorithm, and I think it's a pretty good one. So if you have a cardiac mass and you don't think it's a clot, 30 to 1,000 times more likely that it's a secondary cardiac tumor coming from somewhere else. And if it is coming from somewhere else, it's a metastasis. And you have to ask yourself the question, does this patient have a history of cancer or is there a cancer I haven't found yet? It's crucial. If this is a primary cardiac tumor, which is much less likely, 90% of these are benign, with the most common being the atrial myxoma. But other types can arise. And now we're, you know, you're equipped with the characteristic findings of the others. But a, a myxoma is usually a safe bet if you think it's a primary cardiac tumor and it's arising in the atrium. Um, malignant tumors can arise, but are much less common. The sarcoma is the most sarcomas are the most common with lymphomas and mesotheliomas um, occurring as well. So the general thought process when you see a mass. Could this be a normal variant? You always want to ask yourself that first. Is this a normal variant? Um, is this a artifact? Um, and then if you're convinced that it is something, the most common are going to be thrombuses and vegetations. And if you can convince yourself that it's neither, and you think that this is a neoplasm, is this a metastasis? What clinical evidence do I have that this person has a history of cancer or not? And then if you have ruled that out and based on everything that you found if this is not a metastasis could this be a primary cardiac tumor and if it is is it benign this is a general approach to looking at cardiac masses for those in fellowship or early uh, early career now we've gotten a ton of information let's put it to work our final case this is a patient that's currently admitted to Grady Hospital. She's a 56-year-old female. Um, she works, I think, as somewhat of a custodian overnight at Grady, uh, not, not at Grady, but she works at one of the Emory hospitals. Um, and she presented uh, with right abdominal pain. She has no other history besides hypertension. Um, she had a CT scan. Uh, actually, I'll go first to the CT scan. So she had this CT scan of the abdomen that revealed a very large mass within the liver. And this mass has the collection of maybe that's calcium, maybe that's contrast within, um, within the, the mass. Um, this measured about eight centimeters in diameter. And what they also found incidentally, like we've been talking about, Incidentally, she has this enormous mass in her right atrium as well, and it's encompassing the entire right atrium. This measured about five by seven centimeters. Um, and on echo, which was done next, we see this somewhat gelatinous, I say gelatinous, but it really looks the same as all the others that we've seen, right? So it's somewhat gelatinous appearing, enormous mass, within the right atrium and it's protruding just slightly through the tricuspid valve. Um, and here's a four chamber view where we see it similarly bulging, this mass bulging through. So this lady had no chest pain, no shortness of breath. She exclusively complained of just abdominal pain and no nothing um, significant on cardiac exam. Um, this was the mass on cardiac MRI, and again, you see that it's encasing um, the, the majority of the right atrium. I'm not so sure if this is maybe a stalk here that I'm pointing to with my mouse, but I'm not sure if this is a stalk extending through it. Um, the rest of the left ventricle, the rest of the heart was otherwise normal, but you can see this mass is so large that the, the septum, the atrial septum is somewhat bowing into the left atrium. 
Um, very interestingly, so this lady was taken to surgery yesterday. And before her surgery, CT surgery requested a pre-op left heart cath. And her pre-op left heart cath shows a very significant, um, a small, small to medium sized blood vessel coming off the proximal RCA and extending into this mass in the kind of posterior right atrium. And this mass is very, very active and it's got a lot of blood vessels running through it. So I, I thought this was one of the most interesting parts of this case. So she has an entire branch of her RCA feeding this right atrial mass. Um, so I should have included another slide here. How do we put this case together with everything we've, we've talked about? So again, I harp on the puzzle pieces. So history, she had no cardiac symptoms. She mainly presented with a, an abdominal symptom that may be related to um, her hepatic mass. And she actually presented after lifting something heavy. Um, so she's had a history of what we know to be a large hepatic mass that may be malignant. We know that this mass is extremely metabolically active. And we know that the mass is very large um, encompassing the entire right atrium. So if you've been listening, the, the way to probably piece this together is this is most likely going to be a metastatic mass arising from the liver lesion, which has moved either hematogenously, most likely hematogenously um, into her right atrium and seeded into the heart. So this lady had her resection yesterday on Thursday, and we'll have the biopsy or we'll have the pathology results very soon. But my wager would be that this is a um, metastatic um, angiosarcoma arising from the liver and seeding in the heart. Um, so in summary, your differential for cardiac mass is gonna include thrombus, vegetation, cyst, and neoplasm. Um, I should take out cyst, that's really rare, but um, thrombus, vegetation, neoplasm, and we talked about the progression of how you should think about that in your head. Primary cardiac tumors are exceedingly rare, so you're gonna have to convince yourself that that's what it is before you say that that's what it is. And it's so rare that, um, again, think about thrombus or vegetation first. Myxoma is gonna be the most common if it is a primary cardiac tumor. And metastases is, again, much more common than benign. And malignant primary tumors are extraordinarily rare. Um, this is important because of basic knowledge of the neoplasm are gonna help guide your diagnosis and your clinical decision-making and help you decide what to do and how to manage these patients. Um, Management's often gonna involve a multidisciplinary approach and often different modalities of imaging. Um, so usually this is gonna be cardiology, CT surgery, radiology, um, it's, and um, oncology as well. For benign tumors, prognosis is good. And for malignant tumors, prognosis is very, very bad. Whether that's malignant tumors metastasizing to the heart, which is usually a sign of end-stage disease, or uh, malignant tumors arising from the heart, which is usually near fa mostly fatal in the first year. Um, we do have a new cardiac tumor board here at Emory, which I, I believe, which has been uh, around for the past few months. So that's something to consider if you would like to re refer your patients. And, and we, again, have that um, multidisciplinary discussion at these cardiac tumor boards. I want to include a quick plug for that. These are my references. And I wanna give a few acknowledgements. So Dr. Mondawat um, did me the pleasure of, of going through my slides and helping me add some important points. And almost all of my echo images are given to you courtesy of Dr. Joel Fellner. I also wanna thank um, everyone who uh, listened to a portion of this talk previously and helped me practice. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the first year class uh, first year fellows class, we are almost done, almost second years. Um, uh, I want to thank Dr. Williams as well for being just an all around great guy. Um, and that is it. I want to thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Thanks, Godly. Um, uh, appreciate the shout out too. Um, I have a I guess a, a sort of a comment slash question. I, that was an excellent review and thank you for that. Um, uh, for me, some of these trickier cases are the incidentalomas. Um, 
that we find, you know, in this era of, of more and more frequent cardiac imaging with CT and MRI and echo, uh, you know, a lot of times these get picked up as you alluded to incidentally. So when you pick up a papillary fibro, you know, particularly a large papillary fibroelastoma incidentally, you know, not in the setting of a stroke or embolic event, or you even, yeah. we've even had a couple of cases uh, in our, in our HCM population where we MRI these folks frequently picking up small left atrial myxomas uh, with, you know, in an asymptomatic patient, you know, what to do with these, yeah. that, that can sometimes be a, a tricky situation. I think the, you know, the myxomas are probably somewhat less because those tend to grow and progress and become more of a problem. But these incidentally discovered, particularly large, sort of aggressive looking papillary fibroelastomas. Uh, just wondering if you came across, you know, any recommendations or thoughts in your, in your reading. Yeah. So we actually, I actually came across a case at Grady this past week of a patient who had an echo done that I read. Um, uh, this is a patient with a history of a, what was thought to be a papillary fibroelastoma actually within the left ventricle. And um, I think she was around 70 years old. And what they decided to do, she had a, um, just a, a, a discussion with her cardiologist. And they decided after multiple talks that they just wanted to uh, monitor it. It was about, uh, it was less than a centimeter in size or so. Um, and she had no history of anything related to embolization. So they decided to actually just anticoagulate because some fibroelastomas, as you know, can develop clot around the, around the outside within the little fronds or whatever. But she's been surveillanced for a number of years and has done well. I think the answer to your question is that you kind of have to take it on a case by case basis based on the hi history of embolization, the size of the tumor, um, the type of tumor and the, you know, the patient's age. So I think if you have a patient who's young with a large mass, um, so for example, the patient that I presented last, she was relatively young and her mass was so large that it's, it's eventually, even though she's asymptomatic from a cardiac standpoint, she's eventually gonna develop some type of symptom. So I thought it was reasonable to uh, uh, take that out. But if you have a somewhat smaller mass, let's say an older patient um, and one that types of masses that are known to not grow so rapidly, I think a method of surveillance would be reasonable. Godly Stan Sherman, a uh, quick question, nice. Nice review. This is the only place I really want to see these tumors uh, is on a talk. But basically, when you read about uh, myxomas and you read about atrial fibrillation, were you talking about atrial fibrillation just immediately post-op where, you know, lots of times we see atrial fib? Or were you talking about late onset atrial fibrillation? And if it was late onset atrial fibrillation, was it frequently enough that they were recommending that it's surgical excision, they also maybe do some surgery to prevent atrial fibrillation? That's a really good question. So what I was referring to was long-term follow-up. The, the papers where I mentioned the 22% of AFib was that long-term follow-up. I think where that may have been a little confusing was that the two specific cases that I presented were both post-op AFib. Um, I did not see anything about anything like ablation or any uh, doing anything intra-op um, as somewhat expected management in atrial myxoma um, resection. But that, I think that's a really good, that's a really good thought. But no, I didn't see anything when I did my review. Thank you. You're welcome. Good job. Hey, hey Godly, Steve Clements. Yes. How are you? I'm doing well, how are you? That was a great, great talk. Um, the microscopic picture of the myxoma, if you, that one was a little fuzzy, but uh, if you look at the images real carefully, you'll see that the vessels are surrounded by cells that are called myxoma cells. Like those little blurred areas there are venules that are surrounded by myxoma cells, but they're blurred in that picture. But uh, if you pursue that, you'll find that those are myxoma cells also, plus the spindly looking cells, plus all the kind of amorphous acellular kind of material in them, mm. number one. Number two, in the patient that's being operated on today, I, I can't help but uh, recognize that recurrent atrial branch is giving rise to the 
the uh, kind of blush, tumor blush light that seems to have venules in it too. These tumors have a lot of venules. And uh, if you just showed me that arteriogram, which you look far enough back in the literature, you'll see that published by one of the fellows and myself, that one. And that uh, you'll, you'll see a uh, image that is suggestive of mix. And that suggests myxoma to me, although there's some, there's a lot of nests of vessels back in the back. So I'd love a follow-up on that. If I had to bet on that arteriogram, I'd bet that that could be a myxoma, although it didn't look so much like that. Okay. There are many bets. There are many bets so far. Um, but yes, so, I, I will take your bet for myxoma. So, so uh, when you, uh, I, I know you've done this, but when you see these tumors in the right atrium, as you kind of get mesmerized by the tumor itself, uh, you and the sonographers are trained then to go subcostal and look at the vena cava and uh, to see whether or not the tumor has its origin in the vena cava. Uh, and that, that, that origin can be from many tumors. I used to think, well, that's always renal. Well, it's not, it could be hepatic. It can be adrenal, it can be, it can be thrombus, it can be a lot of different things. Um, so I, I noticed you didn't show those, uh, the vena cava in that particular situation, which is this one, I guess. And it must have been uh, empty. So uh, it was, yeah. There was. I looked. There was nothing in it. All right. So, uh, but anyway, that was a great thinking analysis of tumors. And I appreciate you. Appreciate it. Uh, you taught me a lot. Thank you. All right. God, please, Miss Joel. Uh, can I? Can I <clears throat> let me reiterate what Steve just said. How, how wonderful the talk was. A couple of comments. You alluded to the Lambos excrescence. There are some giant Lambos excrescence that could confuse with, with um, malignant tumors. And um, we've seen a couple of cases of lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum that have gotten so tremendous where uh, we had to uh, think of tumor. We did a fat suppression uh, MRI to, to let us know that it was uh, fatty tissue, not big tumor uh, coming out of the intraatrial septum. And uh, finally, we see cases of clots uh, in the right atrium that jump back and forth across the tricuspid valve. As a matter of fact, as you know, we saw the Grady recently, and they can be confused. They're usually um, thrombi, but they can be confused with uh, tumors also. Again, a very good talk. Appreciate your shout out. and. Thanks again. Okay, well. Um, uh, God, Godly, one other thing. Oh, Robbie. Go. So uh, if you own rounds, Godly, and you uh, have your interns there and you say, well, what kind of clinical syndromes are associated with intracardiac tumors? And you, you, uh, you mentioned them, carny complex, tuberous sclerosis. You may not be rounding on pediatric patients. And neurofibromatosis, which can be associated with intracardiac tumors also. So hmm. anyway, that's a little roundsmanship. And you mentioned it in your talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Godly. And, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, everyone have a great day. And we'll see you next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.